have to click something though first of all sorry <laughs> hi everybody and hi everybody and welcome to our herbs masterclass so this is the second in our two-part series of spices and herbs herbs and spices but we did it the other way around and um as always amanda is going to bring her wonderful and informative science about herbs and how you can get the best out of your herbs which ones have the most potency for your health the most bioactives and then i'm going to translate that into recipes for you in the kitchen so over to you with the science amanda i will but you know what i think most people know us but let's do a oh. quick introduction tell it where you are and where i am and then i will take it and kate will come back a little later so let's go ahead and yeah, intro sure. ourselves completely like we've been chatting for so long now it's like completely like past that point i'm kate waters and i'm in dorset in the uk uh so you see me in my kitchen in my home and um yeah i'll be doing the cooking side of it as i was just <laughs> previously saying and as you were listening in earlier kate's also an incredible um nutrition therapist specializing in um intimate health right i mean i learned so much from you it's amazing <laughs> so so wonderful chef trained in Ireland, right? Ballymaloo, just mm -hmm. yep, that's right. incredible. Yeah, so trained in Ballymaloo when I was 18. So I've been a chef for about 25 years now, uh, but about well, when I qualified um, from uh, College of Natural Medicine in London after study studying to be a nutritional therapist, I then did a little bit more cooking for people in their homes as a private chef, but I pretty much started trying to push the nutrition side and now, I teach online. I don't actually cook for anyone other than my dear family. Um, and I do teaching alongside yourself, Amanda. And, and then I have a very busy clinic, uh, as you say, working with um, mostly women with intimate health problems um, and supporting them and the occasional men with gut health issues as well. So I, I have a strong um, specialism in gut health, but then I've kind of narrowed it down more into women's intimate health as well. Powerful stuff. I mean, truly, um, I've learned again, like so much from you in, in that space. It's certainly not my specialty, but like, I didn't even know it existed, you know, and, and then, you know, it makes so much sense. So, um, you know, people have intimate health issues and uh, it's profound work. So thank you, Kate. So for those of us in the US, um, Dorset is a county on the south coast of England, right? Correct. Yes. I'm about an hour from the coastline, the Jurassic Coast. So that's the bit sort of along the bottom. Um, and it's a very beautiful rolling hills and countryside. It's very green, um, a bit cold at the moment, but rather lovely. Very, very beautiful part of England to be in. It is. Well, I mean, English is incredible. Having grown up there, I, I uh, actually profoundly miss it now. <laughs> Um, but um, it's interesting, the last time I was in England and uh, was with you, Kate, you know, it was in London uh, in uh, 2019, I thought 2020. So, yeah. yeah, and um, it was my mother's birthday and my mother lives in Spain and she was flying in from Spain and uh, Kate and I got to spend some time in London planning what we're doing here. So um, ah, it's like, wow, <laughs> but my, uh, my siblings are all still in England. So. Thank you, Kate. And those of you um, who've not met me, I'm Amanda Archibald. I um, grew up in England, um, but I am in the States, um, in Colorado, western part of Colorado, very close to the Utah border. So I get to look at the western side of the Rocky Mountains, but I get to experience a wonderful, um, wonderful, iconic part of America, which is um, Canyonlands and Arches and Moab, so those beautiful red rock uh, landscapes. Talk about Jurassic as well, different kind of Jurassic, but amazing. Um, and uh, my work is um, specialized in uh, genetics or genomics and the craft of the art and science of how um, we understand how genes um, steer or inform our operating system as human beings, and importantly, how we use food to um, Kind of flip on and off our genes the field of nutrigenomics and together kate and i um, work in the space of teaching um culinary genomics so how we understand how food works with our genes and what we do in a kitchen to optimize that conversation so that's what we do together in our second master class here today build a pantry for your genes with a focus on herbs if any of you were with us in November, we did a focus on spices. And if you didn't get that replay, 
um, just pop a note in the chat and we can make sure you get that replay too. So all that being said, Kate, um, I'm going to jump on. I'm going to lead uh, for the next 15 minutes with just the herb science side. Um, and um, I guess I'll take the full screen here and we'll see you back. I know you're going to be listening and we'll see you back in about 15 minutes. Okay. All right. So, oh, it was Kim wants the spices replay. Okay. So I'm going to stop your video, Kate and take the full screen here um, and I'm going to share my screen so hello again everyone um, let Kate kind of run around with uh, what happens in the kitchen so she can get ready for us um, let me just share my screen everyone see that and I'm going to turn off my video so I'm not distracting to you either there and go full screen so really brief this morning from me. Um, some of you who I've known for many years will recognize a couple of the, the points I'm going to make here. So hang with me. But um, for those of you who don't know me and this you're kind of new to this incredible field of how food talks to your genes, I hope you enjoy um, this presentation. So here's where we're headed. Um, for the next uh, quarter of an hour or 15 minutes, um, we're going to talk about how herbs talk to your genes. What is that conversation? And just a little kind of whisper to you, it's a similar conversation to the one we have with spices. It's a food gene conversation, which we'll just go over really briefly here um, uh, in like about 30 seconds. So how herbs talk to your genes? Which herbs in the UK, herbs, <laughs> are we talking about? I've never understood why in the US we drop the H on the herbs so forgive me in the uk if you hear me dropping h is because of living in the us for 30 years and also with my father being french we also of course drop the h in french and they would be les herbes so um no h <laughs> which herbs are we talking about and then if we pop over to the mediterranean just as a place of reference to get some insights what can we learn from the mediterranean about what we can do with herbs in the kitchen and why and that would be quite interesting for you and then kate will take it from there one point to all of you the um the slides here the handouts as soon as the replay is ready you're going to be able to click in the email i sent to you or we sent to you you'll be able to download the slides download Kate's recipes and also download something fantastic she's put together um, which is all about the concept of the Holy Trinity around the world. I'm just going to close up. Just uh, make sure everyone you've got your videos turned off. You're muted but just make sure your videos turn off so you don't pop in on the video and say wait why is my face there? So um, I just caught that uh, for, for one of you. So just check your settings there. Um, so anyway, Kate produced a fabulous little info brochure on the Holy Trinity or the Sofrito, how we use these core ingredients around the world um, to create flavor in the base of a dish. But there's a wonderful insight from this I'm going to be sharing with you from the Mediterranean. So getting started again, how do we know that food talks to your genes? And this is the field that some of you have heard about already called nutrigenomics. This field of science literally is a field that tells us which food provide the information and nutrients to engage our genes to do their work. So real quick recap, what do genes do? The goal or the role in the body is to provide the recipe to produce the building blocks of our body, which are proteins. Those of you listening in, you know, we have an, a global audience um, of individuals who are super motivated and interested in their health, also practitioners, clinicians who know some of this science. So I'm taking it to the level that we um, are all able to interpret the science here. So nutrigenomics, the field of study that helps us understand which foods we can choose to basically get genes to do their job, to get out of bed and do their work every day. And their work is to produce proteins. Proteins, you know, are the building blocks of the body. They provide the infrastructure or the framework um, to um, build bones and muscles. They're communication molecules, such as for hormones, for example, like estrogen or dopamine. Um, 
And they're also the movers and shakers, the building site workers, the construction workers that get the business of the body done. So they're incredibly important. What we now know in this field of how food talks to your genes is depending on the work that we want a gene to do, for example, extinguish a fire in the body that we know is inflammation, we can literally use specific food that contains the information we need to turn on and turn off these genes. It is absolutely incredible, just like as we know a doctor, or maybe one of you may be able to write a script or prescription for a specific um, medication to do a certain job in the body, so we can actually use food as well. So we also know in the field of culinary genomics that we could take this food, prepare it in certain ways to optimize the whispering that happens between food and the gene. So it's not just knowing which foods contain which information. So for, for, for example, bioactives that I'll be talking about, but what we do in the, ki the kitchen to foster that conversation is what's really, really important. And that is actually what the cooking course of Genius is all about. How do we know what to do in the kitchen to take that culinary conversation to a level that's only just starting to be had in the world. So this really is the 21st century nutrition medicine meets the culinary arts. It's pretty exciting. Anytime you have a, a question, just pop it in the chat. Um, Kate can interfere with me as I'm talking or I can address them, uh, Kate, if you monitor them at the end of my little presentation here. So to put things in context and to understand herbs, and their gene conversation. Let's go to the Mediterranean. And I keep looking at this picture, those of you uh, who've been to the Mediterranean or spent time there, and I'm like, man, I've been to this place. It looks like La Spezia in, um, on the uh, Italian coast, so uh, going up towards Cicatera in um, kind of northwestern, no, wait, northeastern Mediterranean, but the west coast, northern Italy. So that's what it looks like if anyone recognize it, let me know, but I just grabbed it. So let's go to the Mediterranean. So here's where some of you have seen this work before, but let's unpack it again. Because the question is, what do herbs do? And let me give you an example and then dig deep into the Mediterranean. And then how do you know which herbs to use anyway? So what you've heard me talk about so far is that food has information that we can extract that is we can use in a powerful way to talk to our genes. So what you're looking at here are bioactive. So these are molecules in food that you may also know as um, polyphenols or phytochemicals. It's all the same description. We like to call them bioactives. So they are resident in foods, mostly plant, no, always in plant foods, um, in different quantities. And what these molecules do is, um, they're, they're, excuse me, let me go back. They are neither a vitamin or a mineral, and they're not a calorie. What they are are kind of little messengers that can activate processes in the cells that knock on the doors of genes to get them to do their job. So in short, in science, they activate gene productivity or gene what we call gene transcription, which means they knock on the door of the gene and say, hey, get started making the recipe to produce proteins, okay? So what you're seeing are bioactives. Some of you may recognize some of them. Capsaicin is um, a bioactive that's resident in um, chili peppers, right? It has a pain modulating role, but it's a bioactive. It can signal to genes to do their work. Curcumin you recognize probably from turmeric, cinnamaldehyde you find in cinnamon, ginger oil, guess what? Find it in ginger. And some of you are familiar already with quercetin or quercetin, as we say in Australia, and sulforaphane. Silymarin you find in milk thistle, hence milk thistle tea, right? So there's an active component in milk thistle tea. It's called silymarin. And chrysin, if I didn't say, you find in honey, chamomile. Beautiful, right? So these are familiar uh, ingredients, but the magic is coming from these bioactives. So let me just go back one, one point. What, what point am I making here? So these bioactives in food, in the example I'm giving here, can actually turn off this molecule. So we call this 
many of you know this, NF kappa B, and it's a powerful switch in the immune system. We want to be able to turn on our immune system, okay, to um, do the work the immune system does, which is put up an immune defense. It plays a defensive role. But we want to be able to monitor that because as we know in our times right now, we don't want the immune system left in the on position because you become sicker and sicker and sicker. And that can result in an autoimmune response when the immune system is constantly in the on position. So NF kappa B is a modulator. What we want to be able to do is turn it off or turn it down um, to a much lower monitoring role. And we can do this by using foods that contain this information. I'm going to come back and show you how powerful this is in just a moment. So the bottom line is, how do we know which foods contain any one, let me go back, of these bioactives. So we're going to pick luteolin. And we can go into a powerful database called Phenol Explorer. It's out of Europe. So you can, don't go there now, okay, but phenolexplorer.eu. And you can put in the word luteolin and out pops the foods that um, in, in concentrations of this particular bioactive in food. So what you're seeing here, and I'm circling it for you, if we look at herbs, can you see how powerful um, these herbs are in terms of concentration of a bioactive that we're interested in. So common sage, who knows what common means, but you know, maybe what you find at the market, sage, thyme, lemon verbena, Mexican oregano. So Mexican oregano, often from a food gene conversation, is far more um, powerful and potent than um, oregano that may be kind of growing in the Mediterranean or here in where we are in North America or Canada, so USA and Canada. So you can see that the herbs are pretty powerful. That's what I want to show you. Compare that to olive oil or oils, um, excuse me, that says fruit, fruit vegetable oils. So olive oil you're going to find has tons of bioactives. It's a jewel in the world. But if you're looking at a target bioactive, lower concentration. Okay, so here's where, um, if any of you followed my particular work, you know, oh, I recognize this slide. So what am I showing here? What I wanna take you is to the Mediterranean, hence where we started, um, that in the Mediterranean, we know in it, there are, there's many, many longevity zones, many of them now emerging um, in Southern Italy, for example. But what I wanted to show you is we're looking at these bioactives that talk to our genes. And I wanna, take you over to the conversation about longevity. So why do I do that? Because two islands uh, that we're aware of in the Mediterranean are also longevity or blue zones where we have a cluster um, of centenarians. So people who live to be over the age of 100. And the question in the science has been, well, what, what is it about what they're eating and what is it about their lifestyle that is consistent with longevity? Why do we see these clusters around the world? So I'm using the example of the Mediterranean. So Icaria is in the Eastern Aegean, close to Turkey, and Sardinia a close, is, is a, an Italian island off the west coast of Italy in the Mediterranean. So what I'm showing you here is I'm picking up the some of the bioactives that we know can turn off that immune switch that nf kappa b switch and i'm showing you that the people in Icare and sardinia consistently have these bioactives these food gene talking bioactives in the foods that are native to the islands. So we know across, for example, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Uh, we know across the Mediterranean that honey um, is used as a sweetener, far more than sugar, and particularly, uh, so really across all the Mediterranean. But if we look um, in Acaria, a longevity zone, they're getting this bioactive from honey. And of course, chamomile tea is drunk throughout the world, and chamomile tea is drunk throughout Greece, and no doubt in Acaria. So what you're seeing here is these bioactives. If we look at quercetin, the foods that you're seeing here are foods that are resident on the plates of, of, of um, people and their native foods to these islands. Let me take you down to caffeic acid. Once again, it's one of these bioactives and food that talks to your genes. Where is it found in these traditional foods? In fennel, whether it's 
a wild fennel which goes across the islands and uh, throughout Europe and here in the U.S. I was actually, Kate, you'll be interested, here in the high in the Rockies, we were digging up wild fennel. We weren't digging up, we were cutting wild fennel last year, which is amazing. But look at the foods and particularly the herbs here where you find caffeic acid. Again, these are foods that are consistently on the traditional plates of people who live in these islands that are associated with longevity. And the connection I want you to make is these foods contain the information that will turn off that powerful NF-kappa-B immune switch. If you have a modulated immune system, one that's not, you know, attacking you every single day, can you see how that would be consistent with longevity? Healthy immune system, healthy life. It's just one of the points I wanted to make. So now let's take caffeic acid, go back to our phenol explorer, look at the herbs, Caffeic acid, an immune, you know, it's that switch that talks to your genes. Look at the concentration of caffeic acid in these herbs. You're also seeing them in spices, okay, like um, which we've talked about before. So it's not just in herbs, but what I really wanted to show you is herbs are powerful sources of information that can turn on or help modulate that immune um, activation switch. Does everyone see that? So one of you see, this is why I want to go to the Mediterranean, because when you look here, you know, if I think of Mediterranean herbs, I'm thinking of oregano and sage and thyme and rosemary and even mint. Powerful, right? These, if you go to the Mediterranean markets or even markets in the country you live in, but particularly in the Mediterranean, Kate and I were talking about it for genius, piles of herbs. Like in Greece, you go to Greek markets, like powers, like bunches, like flowers, huge bundles of herbs that are just sold, you know, locally and people come on and stuff them in their, you know, in their hampers or their shopping baskets, along with the, the food of the season. So very, very powerful information. And I just wanted to show you here um, in uh, going back to olive oil, here you're seeing some of those same food gene talking switches um, that are resin olive oil, much lower amounts. But the thing about olive oil is a powerful bucket of all of these, as so many of these powerful food gene switches. So that's what I wanted you to see. So now let's just head to the Mediterranean just for a few minutes. And then Kate, I'm handing over to you. We did start a little later. So forgive me uh, taking up the screen here and, and chatting, but you know, uh, stay along with us because we want to show the science so you can immediately translate in the kitchen. This looks like um, a chinka terra to me, but um, three concepts in the Mediterranean that we can apply in our kitchen for our genes. Number one, olive oil and herbs take your genes to heaven. What do I mean by this? If we look at the powerful concept of the sofrito, we may know this is the Holy Trinity, um, in the U.S. and it has various names around the world and that's why Kate produ uh, produce a wonderful uh, download brochure you'll get with the email after this um, class. So the sofrito, basically what you're looking at is taking in France it would be um, celery, onion, um, carrot for example and you kind of soften that to create a base flavor for um, a dish. The bottom line it's about taking core ingredients and sauteing them very slowly and softening. Kate you can talk more more about the how and the why to produce base flavor. So as I said, um, the mirepoix will be the French version. So why is this really interesting? And uh, for those of you who really want to grab science, this is the paper to grab because what the researchers were able to show is a huge benefit in this technique that's used across the Mediterranean, but also around the world in because when you put core ingredients in an oil like an olive oil, let's read what the researchers said. The beneficial effects of the Mediterranean diet may be due not only to the consumption of certain foods, but also the cooking technique uh, such as the sofrito. Because so the sofrito, which is oil-based, will help extract the basically the carotenoids and the phenolic or those bioactive compounds from the food. So the oil acts as transmission or transportation medium to take those bioactives out of food, put them in oil, and get them. And when you do this, it makes them more available to the body. Um, because these uh, bioactives are what we call lipophilic. They like to be in fat. So the sofrito allows you to extract and get it in a medium that the body can use. So that's really the point I'm making in this slide. Here's a classic sofrito. It varies by country. Olive oil in the Mediterranean cuisine and any oil really around the world 
acts as a transportation medium. And the reason in the research paper that we know this is, as the researchers said, that research has shown that bioactives such as norangenin, we find this in oranges, ferulic acid and quercetin that we find in your onions and garlic and capers, which are found in the sofrito foods, are not found in olive oil. So it's the technique of exposing those foods to the olive oil so they transfer into the olive oil that allows you to basically put food in a medium that talks to the body and talks to your genes. So number one, the sofrito, which has many names around the world, is a very important cooking technique that allows that food gene conversation. That's number one. Number two, how you build a salad makes all the difference for your genes. Uh, and I love this and it makes total sense, but you always have to go to the science. So this is an article or a research paper from the British Journal of Nutrition a number of years ago. What were the researchers looking at? They looked at 27 vegetables and 15 aromatic herbs. So herbs like your rosemary, your sage, or what have you, and some of the spices that were consumed in central Italy. And what they were looking at is two things. They were looking at the total number of those bioactives I talked about or polyphenols, as well as the ability for all these vegetables and spices to act as antioxidants. So phenols and antioxidants. And they evaluated um, when they kind of changed up the salads or what have you and added herbs in and took them away, they evaluated the potency of these, these um, salads, which I'll show you in just a moment. So what they found is when they sifted in among the herbs and spices, they found that lemon balm, marjoram, cumin and ginger significantly increase the antithesis and antioxidant capacity among all the herbs and spices evaluated. So in other words, all the herbs and spices played a role, but if you really wanted to kick it up and get some antioxidant power out of these salads, this is where by adding in these ingredients, you got more potency. The other thing they found is when you added olive oil, wine and vinegar to the dressings, it amped the antioxidant capability even more. So what the researchers were saying is, and it's very simple, right? They said, we stress the need to introduce aromatic herbs as a seasoning supplement in the diet of every age group. The addition of herbs to salads at a percentage compatible with compatibility, which means don't overpower it, make it gentle, make it palatable to you, markedly increase the antioxidant capacity of each of those salads. What that means, it's the ability for the herbs to directly act as antioxidants, but you also now know that those herbs contain a potent amount of food gene talking capability. So they're able also to initiate your conversation with your genes to do their work too. In other words, never build a salad without a fresh herb or a dressing that contains herbs and spices, or as um, Kate's going to show you very shortly, um, infuse salts or infuse oils or infuse vinegars. There's a ton of ways to dress a salad. Just don't miss out on the herbs and spices because they talk to your genes. Very, a very interesting um, um, paper, and you can look at the citation if you want to read it. Um, because this presentation will be in your email. The third thing, and some of you know this, but I just love this um, paper from Greece. Number three, foraging, or we call it wildcrafting sometimes in the US, um, and traditional food ways matter. In other words, what grows around us actually matters. What is native to cuisines around the world really matter. So let me take you really quickly to a paper that I've loved for, for all the years I've worked in sciences, and it's from the University of Athens. So we're looking at traditional foods of Greece in the islands. Look on the left here, and some of you will smile, right? What the researchers at the University of Athens were looking at were green pies. So green pies, if you've been to Greece, and probably many of you have, and even if you haven't, there are those beautiful pieces of pies or pastries, if you will, that contain like a phyllo dough on the outside and they're stuffed with greens like spinach and garlic and yummy, yummy, yummy. So traditionally, 
um, people across the islands would forage for wild greens here. So this is wild fennel, wild chives, a broadleaf dock. So dock leaves, you know those in England, those big white leaves, right? That if you end up walking into a stinging nettle patch, you pull a dock leaf and it, it soothes the stinging, level, uh, stinging nettle sting. Um, and Queen Anne's lace, which is like a, a cow's parsley. We have the same in the, in the States. We may call it a little bit different, but those beautiful white flowers that, that look like lace. So what you're looking at here, which is amazing, are these bioactives that talk to your genes. These are wild foods that are traditionally on the traditional plate in traditional dishes across the islands in, in Greece. Look at the amount of these bioactives. And you may not recognize them. And here's quercetin. It's high, right? There's a lot of this food gene talking molecule in these resident um, foods that are on the plates, on the markets, in our green pies. We saw gluteolin, we saw apigenin earlier, much lower concentrations, but they're there. So here's the kicker in all of this, which I just love. Here's wild foods, traditional foods, full of those food gene molecules. Then what the researchers did is said, okay, well, let's take those same molecules and take regular food, like, you know, supermarket food, like lettuce. Onions we know are full of quercetin, but we're gonna take broad beans, we're gonna take celery, take an apple. All they're trying to show is all of these foods will have, not all of them, that many of them will have some kind of notion or presence of these bioactives, but in much tiny amounts. Can you see this? Then if I were to flip back to here, and show you the wild foods, the traditional foods. Some of them we don't even know what they are, right? But foraging is a traditional part of cuisine and plates around the world. And they contain food or information that talks to our genes versus our traditional supermarket or more modern ubiquitous foods. Uh, I know some of you will be smiling because you see me show this uh, slide so many times over the years. But every time I show it, it's like it's so powerful. It, it tells you why we want to use uh, you know, local foods, why we want to have a garden, while wild crafting and foraging has been such a successful means of providing food for centuries, and it's still important. So where I want to leave you with this, and Kate, if you're ready, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, is that herbs matter, and hopefully what I showed you here is the why. So I'm going to stop my share, oops, <laughs> and start my video again. Oh, my video doesn't want to start again. So um, hopefully, Kate, you can come on and um, take it from here. Oop, we've lost Kate. <laughs> oh, I have to let you in. Um, oh, sorry about that. Hold on a minute. Where is Kate? We've lost Kate. Stand by here. <laughs> uh, where are you? Uh, there you go. I, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Can you come in now, Kate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So yeah. sorry. That was my fault. Here she is. Oops. We lost you again. No. Hold on. I'm going to <laughs> For some reason, I can't start my video again. So I'm going to just like chat behind the scenes and hand it over to you. Okay, that's fine. Um, I've just put the overhead lights on. It's getting a bit dark in here, so just let me know if it starts flickering, and I will turn them off, and we'll just cope with the uh, the, the studio lights that I have. It's all good. I'll it's monitor it for you. Excellent. Great. Um, so, following on from your fantastic talk there, Amanda, about herbs, let's work out how we can bring that really simply into the kitchen. So, as you spoke about. Putting herbs into any salad is just such a great way. And they add so much freshness and zing. And putting herbs onto vegetables or just onto the dishes. We don't use enough herbs in this country. You know, we got, get sold in the supermarkets, tiny little bags of small, you know, sort of 15, 20 grams of herbs. You want to be buying them big, like a bunch of flowers and utilizing them in everything, utilizing them in every single meal that you possibly can. Um, can I switch to full screen? Uh, are you not seeing me right now? Is that the problem? I have you on full screen. Yeah, we have you on full screen. Uh, somebody's just said that I'm not on Kim full says, screen. We can see that... you full. You yeah, can? you're full. Oh, yeah. All right. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so we're going to start with some nice little gentle, uh, apart from, you know, using the herbs fresh or just cooking them into the end of a dish. So soft herbs, 
need to tend to go into the end of the cooking. They can take a small amount of cooking. So for instance, like, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, but too long and they will start to kind of um, brown a little bit. Whereas hardy herbs, I have some, um, some bay leaves here, some rosemary, things like that time. They will definitely take long slow cooking and can go right in at the start of the dish. Although saying that when I make a tomato sauce, I actually tend to, when I'm frying the garlic off, I tend to throw in the basil leaves with the whole stalk and then blend it all at the end because the stalk itself has got so many beautiful compounds in it as well, not just the leaves where a lot of the volatile oils end up. So um, let's do some recipes. So zatar is a beautiful blend of sesame seeds, um, oregano or thyme or marjoram with sumac, which is a seed from a plant um, that I actually amazingly have in my garden. I realize it has these beautiful sort of big sort of floofy white lacy flowers that come down. And I realized last year that it might possibly be sumac, but it was just as it was dying, I need to harvest the seeds off it next year. Um, so the, the, the herb, I happen to use thyme, but you can use any blend or mix or individual herbs. Um, the sumac, the sesame seeds I toasted slightly, and then some salt, and you just grind it up in a either in a pestle and mortar if you've got one i've already pre-grounded this grind this or you can use a spice blender this is a coffee grinder that i have that i use for grinding herbs in you could use this but what you really want is to get um, this slightly sort of coarse texture i'm going to come over to the camera to show you i don't know if you can kind of see there this sort of slightly coarse texture you don't want it to be super, super smooth, but you can use that so easily to sprinkle on top of anything. Sumac is probably actually my favorite herb and the one that I consume the most of. I have it anytime I have eggs or on a salad with chicken, it goes beautifully. It's got a sort of lemony, citrusy note to it. Not lemony, but it's a sort of citrus note to it. And it's quite mild, but it kind of adds a really nice little sort of uh, additional tone to what you're eating. So that's definitely one of my favorites. So super simple, once you've made it up like this, it'll store for quite a while. I mean, the, the, the sesame seeds themselves, the oils will go rancid at some point, but um, I would quite happily store this in a cupboard for at least you know a couple of weeks, if not longer. The, if you store it in the fridge, you might find that the, um, the moisture in the fridge starts to dissolve the salt and you could end up with quite a sticky, um, sticky product after a while, but it would keep longer in the fridge for sure. I've never actually kept it in the fridge because it gets eaten far too quickly. And obviously all these recipes will come out to you um, with the replay of the video. Uh, so another one that you will all know, and it's just super simple, you know, I'm not sort of really telling people anything out of the ordinary here, but pesto. There are so many different ways to make pesto and it's such a delicious and fantastic way to get herbs and olive oil into a dish. So I, did, I made a traditional um, basil pesto here earlier uh, with some pine nuts and some Parmesan and some olive oil and a pinch of salt. And you can just see the top is just starting to brown slightly. So a really good way of storing it and preserving it. Um, I shouldn't have put that spoon in is to pour a little more olive oil, oops, sorry, very carefully over the top of it. And that will seal any of uh, the, the pesto down below so that the oxygen doesn't get to it and the top doesn't um, oxidize and start going brown. Um, you can put a touch of garlic in there. You don't have to use cheese if you want to be dairy free. It's called a pistou. And um, you can put something like nutritional yeast flakes in that will add a slight cheesy note to it. Um, you can change the leaves up. So it doesn't mean you know, basil is the traditional one, but you can use any soft herb. You could do a coriander one if you wanted to, but I find coriander tends to go better with things like a sort of sambal with kind of slightly more um, Southeast Asian or Asian type flavors, but you could totally put coriander in there if you wanted to. You can make it with parsley, but again, parsley has quite a um, grassy note to it when it's on mass and it needs quite a lot of other things to balance it out. So that might be better in something like a gremolata where you chop it with lemon zest and garlic and salt and sprinkle it on top of things. But things like wild garlic, which in the UK will be coming up very, very soon, is absolutely fantastic 
for making pestos with. I actually make huge vats of it and freeze it so that I can eat it for the next six months or so, because we only have a sort of uh, a six week window or so of the, uh, the pesto being available. Rocket is another one that's really great and does really well as a pesto. And even kale, although the leaves are slightly tough with kale, so you need to make sure you've got a decent blade in your blender to really make sure that it's nice and smooth, but you can totally um, uh, use kale as a pesto as well. And then if you're using that uh, uh, kale as a, uh, and the rocket as well, they both contain sulforaphane, which is a major antioxidant. So on top of all the other wonderful components that they have, you're getting that in too. So lots of lovely ways of making pesto there. Now you can infuse oils, sorry, I've got over there. You can infuse lovely olive oils that Amanda was talking about uh, with herbs quite easily. Um, I'm not gonna show you any of those today, but it's super simple. You can either use a cold method with oil where you are much better for soft ingredients. So for instance, garlic, but it works very well with spices as well. This is one I've got here, so it's brother rubbish jar it's got the label still all around on it but this is just um this we quite often have this just sitting in the fridge is sliced bits of garlic in oil and it will keep in the fridge easily for a week the oil sort of solidifies a bit around it um but the oil itself gets a really nice strong garlicky smell so you can drizzle the oil itself over something and you're not consuming the garlic if um and um a lady Anna, who I have been in touch with before. Um, if you have issues with low FODMAPs, or sorry, with high FODMAP style foods like garlic, this is a really nice way of having a garlic taste in your food without consuming the garlic fibers, which can cause the bloating and other issues that come along with things like SIBO. So I would make a lot more oil in this, uh, but you can kind of, um, Get the flavor of the garlic without actually consuming the garlic compounds. Another way of doing it is to heat the oil up to about 50 or 60 degrees centigrade, which is roughly double for Fahrenheit, so about 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now on the recipe card, I need to actually change it. I realized I've put between um, 50 to 60 or up to 150 degrees centigrade, but you're going to denature the oil the hotter it gets. And therefore, I actually think all you want is to warm it so that it's drawing the volatile compounds out of the spices or the, the herbs that you're using uh, in it. So um, a nice way of doing it, you can do it over a bain marie, but it's a lot harder to keep it at a set temperature. The other way of doing it is actually doing it in the oven. And if you get a something like a, a, a tin, loaf tin, you can fill that up with oil and let's stick with the idea of garlic. You can put lots of slices of garlic in there or crushed cloves of garlic, leave it in there for about an hour or so and that garlic will slowly infuse into the oil. Then let it cool down, strain it and keep it in the fridge. Um, this, when it's this cold sort of oil, it really, uh, it would last for longer than a week, but with garlic, I was thinking, you know, by about a week, you need to be uh, changing it. Although the oil does um, uh, stop any growth of bacteria or anything happening there. With the hot oil, um, you can keep it for a month, but it needs to be kept in the fridge again. And the only problem with that is, is then the oil solidifies. Whereas if it is just spices going into an oil, you can pretty much do that in a cupboard. A nice way of um, doing it again is with vinegar as well. And again, the vinegar, uh, the acidity of the vinegar will um, stop any growth of any, any bacteria happening. So I'm gonna do one super quick in front of you. So I've got some lovely bay leaves from my garden, which I'm just gonna thread into a bottle. I'm so jealous you have those fresh bay leaves, you know? Well, <laughs> so beautiful. It, they're and so they're different than different. the dried up ones. <laughs> they really are. They really are. It's, and it's we've got a huge tree hidden behind an apple tree outside. So I use it quite a lot. I'm also going to put some uh, rosemary in as well. Wonderful for waking up the senses and uh, vasodilation. So getting oxygen into your brain. And I'm also going to put... And this is a herb task, but I'm going to put a few Szechuan peppercorns in there as well, just to um, add a little bit of heat to the vinegar, which I think would be a nice addition. I have lost my funnel, so I'm going <laughs> to do it by hand and make a mess. Use a funnel when you're doing this, I think, is the um, 
the key lesson there. And then I'm just going to top it up with some vinegar. So it's just so simple. So you can play around with all of these ideas. It doesn't have to be any particular way. Oh, this is raw apple cider vinegar. I should have given it a good shake before I started to get the mother uh, broken up inside it so that it will continue over into the herbs because that has its own fermented um, properties that it brings with it as well. You need to leave this for about a week for the herbs to really start imparting some sort of flavor, but it does, you know, it will last for so long. The herbs will start to go brown. That is going to happen. And because of the peppercorns in there, you'd want to sieve one at something like this, unless you wanted the peppercorns going into, for instance, your dressing. Um, but as a, you know, as a gift for somebody, there's quite a few things that I'm going to be showing you today that would make beautiful gifts for people, you know, rather than buying people things, how's about we start making our presents and giving more food? Kate, so let me I, just um, ask you a question there. There's one sure. from Vanessa, but because you, um, so I'm going to ask you a question in a moment, Vanessa. Um, I have a question about vinegar. So you use an apple cider, cider vinegar there. That absolutely makes sense. Duh. But if you were going to use any other vinegar, like a champagne or a red white vinegar, any insights on how to determine if it's a quality vinegar? Versus, you know, how, how do we advise people on what to look for when buying an off the shelf vinegar if we're not making it ourselves? Yeah, so unfortunately, the more expensive it is, the more likely it is to be a good quality vinegar. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it needs to be made from a good wine to be a good quality vinegar. So, you know, the sort of 90p bottles of white wine vinegar in the supermarket are going to be made from cheap wine. They're absolutely fine to use. There's nothing wrong with them. But if you're looking for a very specific one, you may need to go to a shop or an online shop that sells slightly more um, uh, bespoke vinegars. And you can certainly get like Chardonnay vinegars out there. And mm -hmm. I have in my cupboard things like sherry vinegars, which again have a very, um, it's a slightly more subtle acidity to them. Not quite the sweetness of a balsamic vinegar, which again is a completely different type of vinegar, um, which is aged in, in barrels and, you know, proper Madonna uh, ba uh, balsamic vinegar will be generally a little bit thick on the thicker side. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, in terms of the supermarket stuff, you know, it's going to be what it is. You, you know, maybe they might have the odd one that costs a little bit more. And it will generally be because it's made from a better bottle of wine. Um, oh, you can really easily make it by yourself. You can buy like this ceramic um, pot. Uh, I think it has a, a hole somewhere specific on it. I can't remember exactly. And you pour a decent bottle of wine into that and then you just let the air do its thing and you make vinegar that's very true time. you know if you ever have any wine left in your bottle right you can make vinegar um so um vanessa was asking uh, two questions kate what is your preferred oil to roast veggies with that's number one what's your preferred oil um, i cook and consume mostly always olive oil extra virgin cold pressed so that's the first pressing um, and we go through quite a lot of it mm -hmm. to the point I just bought 25 litres of it the other day because it, it was going to save me about 200 pounds to do mm -hmm. it that way. And then we decanted out into, into a bottle. And I know a company that I use for testing over here um, in Vivo, they actually have an olive grove in Spain and they are nurturing it and bringing it. It's a 500 year old olive grove and they're bringing it back to life and um, they're selling off the oil in large containers. And I was so excited to get one um, because it's just such beautiful oil. I tend to pick one though that is not too pungent in terms of, um, you know, you can get obviously a huge variety of uh, types of olive oil in terms of, if we're just talking about the extra virgin cold press, just in terms of, um, bitterness and those really green olivey notes or you can go through to a much milder one I tend to cook with with milder ones the really deep green olivey um pungent ones I would almost leave more for a dressing or a drizzling onto a particular type of dish like a, something like a mozzarella and tomato salad where you've got a lot of acidity and um creamy tones and then that that additional flavor can really cut through that um or onto something like 
baked figs with um, melon, or I don't know, something, you know, rocket and something where those flavors are going to come through. I wouldn't waste an oil like that, but, you know, I tend to use um, a slightly milder taste in oil through all of my cooking, and then I occasionally get, you know, really um, more pungent olive oil for different things. But I right. think it's something quite mild. And I think too, Kate, you would agree, because this comes up a lot about cooking with olive oil um, that, you know, throughout the Mediterranean where it's traditionally used, you know, it is used in a high heat form. And I think it, it is, whether it's paella or what, whatever, in Greece, so fry with it, but, it, but it's high heat, short duration. But I think the other point is they're using super fresh olive oil, you know, I mean, because it literally, you can look, almost go like to the gas station, right? And dispense wine and olive oil. And, and that's the part of it that it's not oxidized. Um, it's very fresh, and so that's why they will cook at a high heat. Would you agree, Kate? You know, that's yeah, part yeah, of it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but also you've got to look at what the other options are. So, you know, there's, there's, there's coconut oil, which is, you know, another it's a saturated fat. It's, um, it, it does take slightly higher heats. And I think, um, you know, this is something we talk about a bit on the course, Amanda, isn't it, as we go over the different temperatures for different uh, fats. Um, I believe it might be avocado oil is one of the-, the Yes, the avocado oil. Mm -hmm. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm gonna spend that much money on an oil, I'm not gonna cook with it. I'm gonna consume it. <laughs> so exactly. it's, it's about balance, I think. And, you know, I don't roast or fry all my food. Correct. It's, a, it's a, a small portion of that will be roasted or fried. I'm not somebody that doesn't roast or fry, but I certainly don't consume only that style of cooking. So you're pairing that with piles of vegetables and antioxidants and polyphenols and everything else that's going to counterbalance any particular badness that's going on. Hopefully there's not too much badness in there, but you know, I, I think we need to address all of it with a little bit of a... Um, an open mind to the fact that you know yes if you're eating purely fried foods then there's a problem <laughs> with that in, in itself right. um right. but even you know if i am frying something i wouldn't necessarily fry it in a a really beautiful expensive olive oil um, mm -hmm. I mean, as in a deep fry I very rarely do but um i'd probably go for more of a rapeseed oil or something like that right but yeah it's yeah okay thank you <laughs> Was there another question or should I get um, Just, uh, and I'll answer it while you, you grab your next, Kate. So does high heat denature the EVOO? Again, I think, Vanessa, we're looking at freshness of the oil. Unfortunately, if you're not close to where it's, um, you know, produced, it does get uh, stuck in the supply chain and we never quite know. Um, exactly how fresh our olive oil is, but I'll uh, certainly address more of that in the course, but all high heat will denature bioactives. So, you know, this is what we're trying to preserve. And so it's an important part of when we're looking at the, the uh, gene, how we handle food to talk to our genes in the kitchen. It's about having a cooked raw approach. It's about a variety of cooking techniques um, to preserve the bioactives. So um, yes, it can denature bioactives, but that's where you use herbs. That's where you bring in, like we said, infused oils, the flavored salts, adding fresh herbs at, um, you know, just before serving, mixing herbs into your salads, et cetera. There's a lot of ways, I can say skin a cat because I can't think of anything else, but you get the point. <laughs> so hopefully that helps. All right, Kate. One, one more thing about oil. <clears throat> I don't know about in America, but here, when you look at the shelves of olive oil in the supermarket, you get extra virgin olive oil, virgin olive oil, olive oil. These have been, um, the stones have been pressed and pressed and pressed again, again by machines. And the moment they get into that machine pressing system, they're being heated mm -hmm. That's off true. the bat. And this is why it's super important to be having the extra virgin. You want that cold, it has to say cold pressed on it because then it's been pressed by a stone. The moment it goes into a machine, you cannot guarantee that that machine has not heated up to a certain temperature and potentially already denatured that olive oil long before it's arrived in the bottle then potentially sat in a warehouse on a supermarket shelf for goodness knows how long. The other problem is that um, certainly for here uh, in the UK is that unless it says country of origin Italy or country of origin Spain, for instance, if it says country of origin European Union or um, uh, just Europe, 
then it can be oil mixed from lots and lots of different com uh, countries. And some of them can be, you know, really quite far fetched. They are not, shall we say, um, natural olive growers, perhaps, and maybe not made in quite such stringent and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, they've not stuck to the guidelines quite so much. So, you know, you want to be looking at cold pressed and extra virgin olive oil. That is that sort of, you know, the and it does make it more expensive doing it that way, but it's, it's really important. OK, um, so Amanda spoke about sofrito when uh, in her um, science part of the talk and I sort of took that idea, I mean, the whole point about the sofrito is that you're cooking it in olive oil and you're drawing out a lot of the, the beautiful nutrients because of that cooking process. But I was, and I know this is potentially not herbs so much, this is more vegetables, but there's still so many amazing compounds within this that we've tried making a fresh vegetable bouillon and you could totally add herbs into this. And so I have a dehydrator but you could do this in your oven at about 50 degrees and just dry them overnight. You just want to make sure that they are totally dry before uh, blending them up in your blender. And in this, we have got kale, we have got parsnip, we've got carrot, we've got little squiggly bits of onion, we've got leeks. Um, I actually forgot to put some herbs in it, which is <laughs> pretty bad for a herbs lecture, but it could totally have had some parsley in there. Let me bring this over and just uh, show you up close of what's what's in there. So then I powdered it in a Vitamix, which has a, is a high-speed blender. Um, you could do it in any blender, but what I noticed was at a certain point I stopped and it was still um, quite bitty. Let me try and uh, actually have to put it back in there to show you a little bit like, I don't know if you can see if it's a bit too dark to be Yeah, able just to pull see back that. a little bit. There you go. There we go. Yeah, now you can see yeah, it. Yeah, so you can see the little bits of carrot are still quite bitty. Fine if that's being put into a liquid as a bouillon. But what I do with this is I actually coat um, vegetables before roasting them in it or meat or chicken. I'll, I'll, I'll put some of this on as a kind of marinade almost. And so I want it nice and, and finely powdered. So I took it a bit further in the blender and took it to this very fine, um, this very fine powder here. Perfect. And it's just such a lovely additional thing to have in your cupboard. And as I say, you could add lots and lots of different herbs into that as well, just to bring in those compounds too. It's such a brilliant idea. We, uh, Kate had showed this idea um, probably about a year ago. And basically, what a wonderful way to preserve the season too. You know, or if there's something on sale at the market, you know, it could be beets and carrots, whatever you want to do. And what you're basically doing there is like making your own supplement as well. So, I mean, like, like Kate, you said you can just add boiling water we didn't see it. you can make your own tea out of it if you will but you can dredge your fish in it your chicken in it or whatever or just use it as a flavoring so essentially you're drying vegetables and herbs and you're pulverizing them and you've got your own powder um as uh, many of you know and i know kate agrees any way that we can you know make our own food based condiments and supplements you know additions to our cuisine go at it and and i love that it's a vegetable bouillon idea and i think it's brilliant okay kate <laughs> <laughs> so the next one is about getting herbs into flavored salt so this is another one that's a really nice idea for a present to give away to somebody um i think you know things at christmas like infused oils or vinegars some flavored salt um it's such a lovely little kind of gift to give to people and it's so simple so this is wild garlic this is actually garlic that i um uh in terms of preserving the seasons this i i dried last season so i think i was doing this in kind of march or so last year it's definitely by this point in the year it's starting to lose some of its potency in terms of its smell but um and amanda maybe you can comment on how long uh, <laughs> the benefits last for in a dried uh, a dried herb um, but it's you know it's still lovely I again I have this sprinkled on vegetables eggs I sprinkle it on as a marinade onto roasting vegetables or anything that I'm kind of wanting to impart some flavor into the exterior of it 
So in the recipe that you're receiving, you've got lots of uh, three different ways of um, creating flavor within salt. I think they're um, wild garlic, garlic, and rosemary and orange, but you could use anything, you know, lemon and thyme, um, orange and you could do orange and lemon and rosemary or bay leaves or whatever it is that you feel like doing, just dry them out, um, blend, powder them up, and then mix them in with the salt. So for a cup of salt, which is around about 135 grams, I didn't check the ounces of it. And it, um, but a, a cup, you know, just doesn't have to be completely exact. This is the nice thing about recipes like this. Unless you're baking, you don't need to be 100% precise with your measurements. It's about a little bit of free flowing um, ideas. And that's how I like people to use my recipes to um, experiment with them and change them up a little bit. And so we've got a cup of salt here. And we're going to add uh, four teaspoons of dried um, wild garlic. I say it doesn't smell, it still smells, <laughs> it's still got some potency to it. And then you just blend it in and you end up with a beautiful green salt that you can give to somebody in a pretty little jar. Put a nice label on it or keep for yourself by the side of your stove just for sprinkling on whilst you're cooking things and it just um, a point i'm just thinking of because you're asking about the potency of herbs so it's always there's a number of factors there you know freshness before you dry them um you know we we get pretty concerned about, wow, you know, if, if something's traveled across Europe or across the United States, it's been in the supply train on trucks or what have you, it's a law of diminishing returns. The longer it's been out of the earth and exposed to temperature changes and outside of its natural environment, the more you're going to lose potency. Um, so that's, that's part one. So fresh, local as possible. Um, and number two, the question that comes up a lot is about um, dehydration. Um, when you dehydrate something, it's a very low heat. So bioactives are heat sensitive. So the long, low, and slow, including fermentation, by the way, is how you preserve those bioactives. So what you're seeing here with that bouillon powder or using a dehydration technique, you're going to literally seal in those bioactives. Obviously, over time, right, well, you know, you're going to lose potency, but this is one of the best ways to preserve the conversation. Yeah. So the dehydrator I use has uh, temperature settings and I tend to do it as, as low as I possibly can. Um, I think it's actually got um, Fahrenheit on it. I think it's like a 105 or 110 is the lowest setting. Yes. And it does yeah. say raw living food next to it. And it is around about that sort of 50 degree uh, centigrade mark. I think in the raw food community, they, they talk about 49 degrees is the kind of cutoff point, anything above that. Um, is taking it, but you're starting to kill off some of the enzymes and the, uh, the potency. Um, so here we have. Here you go. Yep, we can see that. It's beautiful. Green yep. salt, and it's it's fabulous. And it's such a nice way to add in uh, beneficial, sorry, a, a different flavour to when you're flavouring your dishes. And something we go over about in the course quite a lot is. Uh, one of the first live lectures that we do is about how to create flavor. And it's not just about adding salt. It's yes, you need salt to, to draw those flavors out, but there's so many other components to it. Looking at base notes, medium notes, and top notes with flavor, how acidity changes a dish, how umami changes a dish. And it's so important understanding all of that. But by adding herbs into the salt, you're changing the flavor and the notes of that as well. And something like the rosemary and orange it gives a really nice sort of fresh zing to it that kind of really lifts the dish, whereas I find the garlic sort is a little bit more sort of earthy and draws it down a little bit. Um, so that's that. Uh, lastly, you will get a recipe for a green goddess dressing I'm, or a, a, a delicious green dressing. I'm not going to do that in front of you because it's literally a case of putting everything into a blender and blending it to a smooth, but it contains several different types of herbs, um, I think it's parsley, coriander, or cilantro if you're in America, um, spring onion, chives, basil. Um, there's a touch of honey in there to lighten the, um, the acidity notes of lemon juice and apple cider vinegar, olive oil, and I quite often stick an anchovy in because that will 
not give a fishy flavor, but it adds an umami depth. And then we're getting lots of those wonderful omega-3 fatty acids coming through, but that is completely optional if you want to add that in or not. So you get that along with the, um, the Holy Trinity of foods around the world, which is just an interesting insight into how different countries create base flavor in a lot of their dishes. Um, and that's about it for me in the kitchen, Amanda. Okay, so Kate, one question. Um, what, what type of salt do you use? Yeah, so I use, where's it gone? Hold on, I use uh, Malden sea salt. Aha, yes. <laughs> uh, which pretty much every chef in the UK, you will find uses Malden sea salt. <laughs> it's quite a standard, um, it's a lovely flake. Um, I can show you easily. Let me see where the light is. I can move the light perhaps just round. Mm -hmm. We can see a that. Bit. So occasionally you get these slightly larger um, triangular crystals, but they're not thick and dense like um, kosher salt is. It's very, very thin. And it's a really nice balance, um, the salt that it gives. And because it's the sea salt, you get a lot of the minerals through it as well. We do get some lovely Cornish sea salts in the UK um, and then France obviously has some beautiful salts as well um, there's Himalayan rock salt uh, I think in the states you mostly tend to use kosher salts I think don't you yeah we do a lot yeah but not which, always which tend yeah. to be quite large um, uh, crystals they are and so quite often they need grinding so if you were using a kosher salt for a blend like this I would suggest grinding the salt first so that you're getting um, the herb through the salt properly so it can be something that's sprinkled on rather than um, used in a large amount on so you can kind of tailor the balance of those flavors a little bit more. Totally um, I agree with the um, I'm just it's funny. <laughs> I agree with the uh, Malden salt. We, when I used to live in England, we used to go to Malden like on vacation. For, I don't, I don't know how we ended up there, but we did. Yes, Anna, on the um, pink Himalayan salt. And um, the other thing I was thinking about when you talk about French salt. So you know, traditionally in in Ireland too, and any of these countries that have a coastline, they will actually rake the ocean. Right, they collect the salt. Um, from the from the ocean through these uh, these pools and it's it's a system of dikes into decreasing um, depths of water in these pools and the, the reason I know this is with my father being French as a child he lived in he grew up in Brittany and one of the most famous salts in the world is um, from Guérande it's called Celle de Guérande or Guérande salt and he the people who raked the salt are called saunier, so rakers. So as a child, he was a raker on the salt marshes. So I just love that. Um, isn't that a lovely story? So listen, I'm going to try and start my video again here. And again, it'll be a different video. For some reason, my overhead video doesn't want to work. So I'm going to try and join you, Kate. I'm going to remove it. And if I can't, we'll just, you'll be on screen and we'll just talk. So I'm just going to see if I can come up on a different camera. No, it doesn't want to come up on a different camera. So I'm just behind the scenes, everyone. And you're at Kate. So, um, yeah, it's kind of odd. Um, so the last question, and then we're going to close here, um, is from Joe. What can be used instead of cilantro or cilantro, which you call coriander, uh, the rest of the world calls coriander, if you have the soapy gene, so what would you mm. use? You could use anything, right? But what would you suggest, yeah. Kate? Parsley is the closest um, yeah. adaptation for it. Um, because, you know, when you're looking at soft herbs, basil's got a very strong, pungent flavor. Mint as well. They tend to be more of one family, if you like, and parsley and coriander are different. Um, they're not the same family, but they sort of go into the same bracket. So I definitely use parsley, but um, you know, it has different notes. It is, uh, um, coriander is much more delicate as a herb. When you're slicing coriander, you need to be very careful that you're slicing, that you're not kind of bruising it and crushing it. Whereas parsley can take a real kind of pounding before it really bruises. So it has different properties that you need to work with, but totally you could swap it out for mm -hmm. that. Um, the coriander seed tastes very different to the, the leaf, very true. Um, mm. but you can add a touch of that if you want, but it's not going to give you that same coriander flavor into something. So I'd say go with parsley if you're trying to swap the herb side of it out. 
Oh, that's a good point. And I'm sorry, everyone, I'm hiding like in my closet, <laughs> my office. So you, uh, Kate, thank you for standing there so beautifully and taking up the screen. Um, so uh, one final thing before we close, those of you, you know, if you're interested in the flavored salts and how to mix herbs or spices together, um, there is a Bible out there called the Flavor Bible <laughs> that we use. I, you know, and it, it's if you're one of those people like, oh, I'm not quite sure what goes with what or whether I can put rosemary and thyme together. That is this incredible book. We call it the Bible. It is the Flavor Bible where you can just look up ingredients and find out what goes with what because we're not all intuitive chefs by any means. And, you know, how do you know if rosemary goes with orange? That kind of thing. So that's a wonderful book to grab. Um, from wherever probably on amazon these days but if you have a local bookstore check it out and support them so um all that being said um where oh who was the author and i can't remember just look it up um i don't have it on it's the just shelf. called the flavor bible it's called the flavor bible it should just come up it's quite it well known but, and Anne, um, um, when you pop it in, you you know, yeah, I see you're given the UK, so you have a U in flavor. You know, isn't it amazing how English is different around the world? When you search for it, drop the U. It will probably come up anyway, but if it doesn't come up, just spell flavor the American way, okay, um, without the U. Uh, so all that being said, we're going to wrap up here. You will receive, there's a couple of things. You will receive an email, a replay within 24 hours. I will also put a link to the Spice replay in there for you too, if you miss that so you don't end up getting two emails, okay? And then the second thing is, well, thank you for all joining us here today. And I'm sorry, I'm just a voice coming out of your computer. Um, but thank you all for joining us. If uh, Kate and I put together Genius, um, it's the only cooking course in the world that really teaches you how to cook um, in this new space of culinary genomics. How do you choose and prepare food that talks to you genes? It's part science for me. And then Kate always translates to the kitchen where there is live culinary in there so you can join us. There's live chats. There's a lot of self-paced. We made it a very interactive course. If you haven't signed up already, um, but you're interested in listening to us today, look in the replay email. We're still going to give you a discount of 25% off if you would like to jump in, but you've only got until January 18th to do it. The course actually goes live or launches January 25th and the doors close. So it's not like a perpetually open doors. We would love you to join us and join those who are already with us. So if you're interested, there'll be a link in the email. You can check out what we're doing in the course. Um, and there's a coupon there, but do pay attention because the doors are closing. So we look forward to seeing you in there. You will see this format. If you like it, it's exactly that part science, a lot of culinary, but in this case, you've got culinary libraries, videos, and the opportunity to cook live with us or watch live, as well as just join us in, in, in live chats um, for a few weeks. Anything you want to say, Kate? <laughs> Anything you want to add to that, that before we say you. goodbye? It's a, it's a really um, in-depth course, and, and a lot of what we've done in the spices and um, herbs masterclass has been quite simple. It's been very simple ways of getting these foods into your kitchen. And the course, although we try to keep it as simple as possible, we also go much more in depth as well in terms of both science and the recipes as well. Well, actually, so I shouldn't say that on the science. I think you do keep it very simple the whole way through, Amanda, don't you? Um, yes. But the recipes, they are more, you know, they do get more complicated, um, but there is also the simplistic side of it as well. So wherever you're at with your cooking, I think there's a little bit for everybody in there, including a culinary library of, you know, really basic techniques and skills just to make sure that um, you've got all the base layers covered as well. Have Super. Time to join us. We hope you do, but we're glad you joined us for the master classes. Thank you, all of you, for your, your support and showing up on a Saturday morning or afternoon. Kate, thank you for, um, as you can see, getting your kitchen set up <laughs> so that we can we can walk in there um, and live. We appreciate that so much. It's always fabulous to work with you. So on that note, everyone, look for the... Yeah, look for the replay and all the, the recipes, et cetera, the goodies that will come to you within 24 hours. So we'll say good afternoon and goodbye to you in the um, UK and good afternoon and enjoy your day here in the USA. So thank you, everyone, and bye-bye. Take bye -bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye.